<laughs> Here we go. All right, welcome everybody. Just got the notification via email that we're live. Mm -hmm. So we just have a couple of minutes and then we will begin the planetarium show. And then we will have our special guest on. Hey, Jeff. Thank you for attending another show. Right. Have you been able to get a chance to take the telescope outside, Jeff? The weather getting nicer, I'm running out of excuses not to take one of the telescopes and back and go observing. Yeah, to take one of those Meads uh, LX200s that we have. Mm -hmm. Well, when you get a chance, you can come up and help get those working. I think only two of them work. With pleasure. <laughs> We gotta practice our uh, star hopping skills with the job first. Gotta get ready for an um, actual Messier marathon. <laughs> right? Ooh, it's State Park. Closed at 7. Yeah, closing at 7 definitely won't help. All right, mm -hmm. it's now 8 o'clock. We've got a decent number of people on. So I'm gonna go ahead and we are gonna get started because we don't want to uh, delay anything for when we have our guest. We wanna make sure we have as much time as possible with Amanda when she is on. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and kick off the, the Planetarium show. Uh, for anybody that has not been to one of our shows before, uh, my name is Adam McCulloch. I am the Planetarium Specialist here at Glass Education. And with me is my amazing co-host, Katia Gosman, who is our professional astronomer for the day. She is the expert who will be answering all of your difficult astronomy questions throughout the show. And she is currently an undergrad student at U Chicago, soon to be a graduate student at University of Michigan. So please send your congrats in the chat room to Katia. And we'll be going back and forth between the two of us throughout this show. Uh, but right now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and get started with a little tour of the night sky. I, again, always want to show uh, the trick to finding your way around the sky, and that is to find a certain object up there. So we're going to start with that. Then we're going to take a little bit of a tour deeper into our night sky, and that's going to lead us into the discussion that we'll have with our guest, uh, Amanda Poggle, who is a grad student studying uh, galaxy clusters and gra gravitational lensing. And she has an awesome presentation for us, and we'll have the chance then to uh, ask questions and kind of go through the presentation and learn about all of these uh, really, really cool things. So uh, first thing I want to point out, we are using a program called Stellarium. And Stellarium is really cool because it's literally just a free planetarium program. 
You can download it right now and do all of the things that I'm about to show you on your own. You can explore all aspects of the night sky. It's wonderful for planning your observing uh, trips before you uh, go out there. So you can find out what's up in the sky, where it'll be and when. There's a tons of amazing new information uh, in Stellarium. So I definitely recommend uh, downloading it if you haven't already, because it is a really cool tool. And we're gonna go ahead and dive in. So as I was mentioning, the first thing that you wanna do when you go outside is orient yourself. You kinda of have to know which direction you're facing. So right now, we are at 10 o'clock, and we're gonna go a little bit further to about 10.30, and we're gonna just kinda of swing around the night sky. And one of the nice things about Stellarium, when you can see there's also a really nice uh, bright comet off to the north, uh, Comet Atlas. It's been a very great observing one. Unfortunately, uh, we haven't been able to get it during our observing sessions because it's a little too low. But uh, and here in Stellarium, you can zoom in on just about anything that you want to. Uh, so as I was saying, as you kind of scroll around the sky, you can start to see all of the different directions. Now, when you go outside at night, uh, you aren't going to have this uh, wonderful kind of uh, cardinal point directions up there for you so we're gonna take those down so now once you scroll around a little bit more and you start to disorient yourself it can get a little tricky to kind of figure out where you're looking one thing that I always recommend looking for is something that we're all very familiar with and that is the Big Dipper so here uh, during this time of the year we're actually really lucky because the Big Dipper is very high up in the sky and we're gonna zoom in on the Big Dipper and take a closer look at it. So here we have the seven stars of the Big Dipper. Uh, Dube, Mirak, Vekka, Alianth, Mizar, and Alkid. And so there's also Megrez. Uh, now, honestly, I don't have all of those names uh, memorized. As you can tell, I just had to read them off. Uh, you really just have to rec uh, remember that there are seven stars in the Big Dipper. Six of them are actually fairly bright stars, which makes the Big Dipper one of the best things to look for first because it's very easily recognized. And those six stars ensure that even in light polluted areas, the Big Dipper is still one of the easier things to pick out in the night sky. Now, once you've found the Big Dipper, uh, there's one specific thing that you want to do with it because by just finding the Big Dipper, you really aren't uh, orienting yourself in the sky. You get a kind of general idea, but the Big Dipper can be in a couple of different places, but all, all of them in the northern part of the sky. The Big Dipper is useful though if you take Mirak and Dupe. I should also probably put the line up there, and we'll talk about what these other lines are in a second. But right now you can still see the Big Dipper with these seven stars make a big spoon in the sky. But if you take Mirak and Dube and you connect that line in your head and you kind of extend that line down, it'll go straight down until you hit a star named Polaris. Now, if you've never heard of the star Polaris, uh, you probably know it better as the North Star. And the North Star, or Polaris, is actually uh, the uh, tip of the Little Dipper. So now by finding the Big Dipper, you can also use it to then find the Little Dipper. And of course with the name, uh, it tells you that Polaris tells you exactly where the direction north is. So once you found north, if you remember to never eat soggy waffles, you know then all four of your directions and you can figure out where you're facing and start to locate different things in the night sky. Now one thing I need to correct myself on is that I referred to the Big Dipper as a constellation. Uh, the Big Dipper is actually not a constellation, even though it's usually remembered as one of the most famous ones. It's what's called an asterism, meaning that it's part of a larger constellation that looks like something completely different. So really, the Big Dipper is actually part of the constellation Ursa Major. And if you're not up to date on your Latin, it just means the Big Bear. So we have the Big Dipper, and the Little Dipper is, of course, then a little bear. So we have the two bears up in the sky, and you might notice something a little odd about these bears. Uh, we don't normally picture bears wagging long tails. 
And there's a reason these two bears have such long tails. It has to go back to the story of how they got into the night sky. It was in Greek mythology that these two bears were actually grabbed by the tail by Zeus, who swung them around so fast and so quick and threw them all the way up into the night sky. But when he was swinging them around, because the bears are so heavy, their tails stretched out. And when Zeus let go, they, got, they went all the way flying and got stuck up in the night sky and have remained there ever since. So that's why these two bears have long tails. And it just so happens that these two bears are stuck in the northern part of the sky. And so they are actually always up. As makes sense with the, uh, little, with the North Star or Polaris staying in the same position. That's why the North Star is so handy. No matter when you go outside at night, you'll always be able to find Polaris. Now, another handy constellation to find, unfortunately during this time of year, is very low in the sky, and that one's name is Cassiopeia. And as you can see, it kind of makes a W shape. And it's just above the horizon at this time of night. So if you have some trees to the north of you, uh, you're probably going to struggle to find Cassiopeia. But... Um, I'll show you in a second why knowing Cassiopeia is also very handy. If you know, see that Cassiopeia is on the exact opposite side from the Big Dipper uh, from Polaris. So these two constellations stay on opposite sides of Polaris. And as our night moves along, and we're going to turn the atmosphere off so the sun doesn't bother us in a second. And you can watch the time down here at the bottom of the screen. As the night goes along, Polaris stays in the exact same spot, but the Big Dipper and Cassiopeia go around the sky in kind of a big circle. But they always stay the same distance from each other, so you can always find one of them and use it to find the other. And here comes the sun up in the distance. So we're going to stop and we're going to go all the way back. Because we want to observe and look at stuff that's actually up night. So now we're going to go back to about where we were. We can turn our atmosphere back on because we want our sky to look a little bit like what we're going to look at. So out in our night sky, there's amazing things you can look at, but with the naked eye, you're mostly kind of stuck with looking at kind of what uh, you could refer to as our celestial neighbors. So this next part of the tour is we're going to be more uh, about what's kind of hidden in the night sky and how we view our universe here from Earth. So to start, we're going to look at some of the things that are closer to us. And to start, we're going to look at a very famous star that unfortunately actually already set. But we're gonna go back in time so we can actually view it. And that star's name is Sirius. And Katya, would you like to tell us a little bit about Sirius? While I zoom yeah. in. Sure. So Sirius is a pretty cool star, and you might actually, uh, as Adam was telling us about the North Star, so the North Star isn't actually the brightest star in the sky. Uh, Sirius is actually the brightest star in our night sky, and it is actually twice as bright as the second brightest star, uh, Canopus. Yeah, it is also uh, happens to be, I should correct myself, it's not just a star, it is actually a binary star system. So there are two stars in orbit around each other. Um, one of them is a white dwarf, so a star that has kind of reached the end of its lifespan. Um, it's not fusing any elements anymore, it's just kind of cooling off um, for eternity. And it is actually one of the brightest uh, white dwarfs we have are known. Another really cool thing that you can do with Stellarium in here, as you can see as we're selected on Sirius, there's a whole list of information that it will give you, and you can actually see how far away Sirius is. And as you can see there, the distance is 8.6 light years. Now, light years is kind of a tricky unit to use because it's great for measuring things that are really far away, 
but I don't think everybody has a good handle on how far one light year really is. So one thing I always like to talk about is when you think about when you go into your room at night and you hit the light switch, you don't really see the light travel across the room. By the time you've turned the light switch on and uh, the light kind of shines throughout the room, that light has traveled to everything in your room, reflected off of it, and bounced back into your eyes before you can even conceive that it happened. So light moves so fast that it's really hard to kind of conceptualize and understand. A really good way to kind of think about this, the sun is uh, only about eight light minutes away. So in other words, the light that leaves the sun takes eight minutes to get to Earth. Now, with this star Sirius, Sirius is actually one of the closer stars to Earth, which is in part why it is such a bright star in our sky. And Sirius is 8.6 light years away, meaning that the light that leaves Sirius eight years ago is the light we are seeing today. So that's how long it takes, that's how far away Sirius is that it takes light eight, over eight years to reach us here on Earth. And as you're going to see when we start looking at other things, that's actually not very far away. So we're going to zoom back out and we're going to go look at the next object on our list. And it's one of my uh, personal favorite. And it's a star cluster known as the Pleiades star cluster. We'll get the sun out of the way. So here we have the Pleiades star cluster. And the sun is being really annoying. Anyway, so this is what's called an open cluster. Katya, would you like to tell us a little bit about what an open cluster is? Sure. So uh, open clusters, there's two different types of main, I guess, star clusters that we talk about, an open cluster and a globular cluster. So open clusters are uh, pretty young stars and they're not exactly gravitationally bound and they're not compact. They're kind of, they, um, they're they sparser than a globular cluster, for example, as uh, you see the Pleiades here. Um, and so a lot of open clusters, they will uh, drift apart over millions and millions of years. So it's actually once believed some say that our sun was actually part of an open cluster uh, and all the stars in the cluster will form together as kind of like a family. And then after millions and millions of years, like most families, they will drift apart slowly. Now, one thing to note about the uh, this star cluster is we are now on the order of 444 light years away. So we are much, much farther away now than some of the local stars to us. And this is kind of one of the next uh, closest group of objects. And I have three quick fun facts about the Pleiades. Uh, one, the Japanese word for Pleiades is Subaru. So if you walk through a parking lot anytime soon, hopefully wearing a mask, you can look around at some of the cars and if you've uh, see a Subaru, take a look at that logo, and you'll see the six stars representing the six sisters of the Pleiades. Another fun fact, the Pleiades are also on the Australian national flag. And last but not least, the origins of Halloween are actually traced back to uh, the ancient Celts observing the Pleiades. And when the Pleiades crossed the meridian, or the highest point in the sky that they would cross in the night, and if they cross that exactly at midnight, that's when our world and the afterlife were the closest together. And that's where the tradition of Soen came from that eventually morphed into the Halloween that we enjoy today. So next, we're going to go a little bit farther to a group of objects called Nebula. So Katya, while I find this nebula, and would you like to give an example of what different types of nebulas there are? Yeah, so there are a whole bunch of different types out there. Uh, the one that Adam is going to be finding is called a planetary nebula. Uh, there's other kinds like reflection nebulas, dark nebulas, etc. Think of them as just a whole bunch of gas, uh, like ionized gas out in space. But they come from different sources. So 
uh, what Adam is finding, a planetary nebula, actually the name itself is kind of tricky because they don't actually have anything to do with planets uh, per se. Um, they kind of just, I guess, looked like planets in telescopes when they were first named. Um, but uh, what Adam just found, beautiful. Uh, this is the Ring Nebula. It is one of my favorite objects. Uh, it is like the first object that I ever saw in deep space through a telescope. Um, and so this planetary nebula uh, basically is the remnant of a dying star. So a star like our sun, for example, is not massive enough to go supernova. It needs a uh, star needs to be at least eight times the mass of our sun to go supernova and explode. Uh, so stars that are less than that, below that limit, um, they will end their life a little differently. So our sun is currently really happily fusing hydrogen into helium every single day. I fused hydrogen into helium, it writes in its diary. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's just been doing that. At some point, it's going to run out of hydrogen to fuse and it's going to start fusing with helium. And so this goes on, the cycle goes on and it starts fusing heavier and heavier elements. Um, and while it's doing that, it is expanding out into a red giant and it's shedding outer layer of gas. And so what you see here is uh, in the center that little white spot is a white dwarf so it's like the remnant of the star the core of the star and then outside of it you have gas so the shedded outer layers of the star that are being ionized by the white dwarf which creates all those cool colors <laughs> right and... and this nebula will just keep existing and at some point it'll the gas will slowly like fade away um, and the white dwarf will also just keep cooling off Right, and one other thing to note, we are now looking out into our galaxy, and we're now looking at about almost 3,000 light years away. So the light that left, that we're looking at, uh, when we look at the Ring Nebula, left 3,000 years ago, and we still are really not that far away yet. So the next type of object we're going to look at are things that are actually... Uh, considered just outside of our galaxy. Mati, would you like to tell us a little bit about how awesome globular clusters are? Oh yes. Um, and so globular clusters are also really cool to look at. So there's the, they're the other kind of cluster that I was referring to. So while you saw the Pleiades open clusters, they were pretty sparse, like a few stars, pretty young bluish stars. Open clusters are the complete opposite of that, as you can tell by this wonderful image in Stellarium. They are super, super dense, um, all gravitationally bound to each other, really old stars. They're usually like 12, 13 billions of years old. So very close to the age, the supposed age of the universe, which astronomers now believe is around 13.8 billion years. We are now about 25,000 light years away. Oh. Not yet. Did, were you still talking? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, uh, I, was, I was looking at the video, which is slightly delayed. So we're now about uh -huh. 25,000 light years away, and these usually kind of orbit around the center of our galaxy. And of course, once you've kind of looked at the outer limits of what we can really look at in our galaxy, the next step is to kind of look somewhere completely different. So we're gonna now take a little trip to something that I'm sure all of us are very familiar with. And I hope I didn't just select the constellation. I did. But I can find it pretty easily. So here we have the Andromeda Galaxy. So this is an entire galaxy separate from our Milky Way. And it's actually the closest major galaxy to us at only about two and a half million light years. 
So we just went from 25,000 light years to two and a half million light years. So we've now made quite the jump in distance. And the most distant observed galaxy is actually 32 billion light years away. And that is billion with a B. So now I'm gonna let Katya tell you a little bit about the Andromeda galaxy, and then we will introduce our guest. Right. So um, Andromeda is actually um, the closest major galaxy to the Milky Way. And it is actually at some point going to merge with the Milky Way. And so the galaxies will do a sort of dance. Um, some people think that like if you have a galaxy merging, they like will crash into each other, kind of like a car crash. But that's not actually how uh, that happens. Usually they'll do this kind of slow dance with each other where they like revolve around and around and they'll keep going um, until they kind of disform and eventually merge. Uh, and so there's actually examples of galaxies that we can see out there, we can take images of that are in the process of merging with each other. And so they'll look very irregularly shaped. All right. And now I would like, we would like to introduce our special guest for the evening, uh, Amanda Pongle, who is a grad student studying uh, galaxy clusters and gravitational lensing. And so Amanda, if you'd like to share your screen. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Can people see my screen? It will in about a that looks good. couple seconds. Once I readjust the size. There we go. And I can move us around if we get in the way. So I'll keep an eye out for that. Cool. Yeah, and I'm gonna keep the presentation like in this format if that's okay, just so that I can see you guys and the rest of my computer. Perfect. Okay, so so everyone can see it's good? Yep. Okay, cool. Uh, should I start? No. Yes, let's jump right in. Okay, cool. So hi, everyone. Uh, as Adam said, my name is Amanda and I'm a graduate student who studies uh, gravitational lensing and large galaxy clusters that cause that lensing. So I wanted to start with um, the fact that I use images from the Hubble Space Telescope and I wanted to introduce the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, so here it is. It looks really nice above the Earth. Um, it's named after a famous astronomer named Edwin Powell Hubble. And just a quick few fun facts about the Hubble Space Telescope. So it travels around Earth at around five miles a second. And you can imagine that as going from the east to the west coast in 10 minutes. Uh, it weighs around 27,000 pounds and is 13.3 meters long. Uh, so like a bus, like a school bus. Uh, it has a pointing accuracy of 0 0.007 arc seconds. And to imagine what that means, imagine you take a dime and you place it 200 miles away and you shine a laser at it from where you're standing, that laser will shoot right in the center of that dime. And that's how well Hubble can point to objects that are in outer space that we want to study. So pretty incredible. Um, it contains more than 100 terabytes of data, which is a lot, a lot of data, uh, currently produces 10 terabytes a year. And over the course of its lifespan, uh, this number is probably a lot bigger now. Uh, so. It produces over. It produced over 8,700 scientific papers published with images taken by Hubble. So I think so. Hubble is pretty extraordinary. Um, but what else makes Hubble so extraordinary apart from you know pictures like this and and this? And also, I have a video for you guys of a star cluster um, inspired by Hubble. This was taken for its 25th anniversary. It's a video of a star cluster called Westerlin 2. And this is just a flyby of going inside that star cluster. So this is a stellar nursery, uh, which means that this is where stars are being born. Um, all of that gas that you see here is conducive to star formation. So all of the gas to create a star, you just need a lot of gravity. The gas collapses or compresses, and you have a star. 
Um, so all of these stars that are inside, you can see all of these new stars being formed. Pretty cool. Um, so apart from these pretty images that I'm sure a lot of you have come about in, in when you were looking at space images, Hubble has, has been very important to us, uh, to the scientific community. So Hubble's helped us answer a lot of questions, including it discovered the first auroras on Jupiter. It uh, first spotted exploding stars in the Milky Way, so supernovae. It found distant galaxies that are merging, which told us a lot about how galaxies evolve and how they form. And it also was able to look at, to probe the really early universe, uh, which tells us about how our universe was formed. How did these galaxies contribute to what our universe looks like today? So Hubble has answered a lot of questions. Um, another really cool field that Hubble has observed is called the Hubble Deep Field. And if you guys were here for the last episode, Katya talked about the Space Telescope Science Institute director who decided that he would spend his discretionary time, which was 10% of his time, to observe absolutely nothing in the sky. And this was shortly following the Hubble fiasco with the focusing and, and people thought it was kind of a flop. Um, so this was a really risky thing to do and people said, maybe you shouldn't look at nothing. Maybe we should look at something instead with this really expensive telescope. Um, he didn't listen to them. He said, I'm the director, so I get to do whatever I want. Okay. So, so he looked at, here's a video that will hopefully play. Yeah, okay. So he looked at a field in the sky that was about this size. So one part in 13 million of the total area of the sky and you have the moon for comparison. He didn't look next to the moon because as someone mentioned in the comments, the moon is also really annoying <laughs> for astronomers. Um, and there was absolutely nothing in that field up until that point that we knew of up until that point. And when he exposed for lots of hours with the telescope, he saw this. Thousands upon thousands of galaxies in this field came up in a field of nothing. And this completely shattered our understanding about how big our universe is, right? We thought that the universe was a lot smaller and all of a sudden we see that in nothing, there are thousands and thousands of galaxies. And each one of these specks is a galaxy that contains billions of stars. And in this image alone, in this field, there are 10,000 galaxies, all in a patch of sky we thought was empty. So this was super revolutionary. Um, and so, you know, Hubble then set forth on a mission to probe the sky farther and farther. And uh, here's the next. So Hubble spectroscopically confirms the farthest galaxy to date. So really, really far at around redshift of 11.1. .1. So that's, um, let's see if I can count, uh, 0.4 billion years after the beginning of the universe. So 13.4 billion years into the past, kind of alluding to what Adam was saying before. Um, and so this helps us understand what early galaxies looked like. How did, what did galaxies look like? really, really long ago when the universe was in its sort of childhood phase. Um, and so the Hubble program has been extremely successful, but Hubble is nearing the end of its lifetime. Uh, hopefully soon we'll get to see the James Webb Space Telescope go up. Um, but before it does, one of the latest programs that Hubble has performed was something called the Hubble Frontier Fields. And this is what I work on. Uh, so also, Katya and Adam, feel free to interrupt me if there's questions from the audience. Okay, we'll, we'll do. Okay, so this, these are the Hubble frontier fields. And so the reasoning behind, the motivation behind this program was to figure out how can we push Hubble deeper than we have ever pushed Hubble before? How can we see the faintest galaxies um, the farthest away galaxies, the, mo the strangest galaxies, all at the beginning of our universe. And how can you use those to understand about how a galaxies form and how the universe evolved? Um, so the Hubble Frontier Fields leverage something called gravitational lensing to be able to push this far. Um, gravitational lensing is basically saying, we're using nature's magnifying glass. These galaxies are so massive that they bend space in such a way that 
the light from the galaxies behind them bends and gets magnified so that we could see it. Because otherwise, if they weren't lensed, then we wouldn't be able to see those galaxies. So we're really sort of leveraging this gravitational lensing fact and the fact that these clusters are so massive and can magnify the light of the galaxies behind them. So just some quick fun facts about gravitational lensing and a, you know, explanation. So it typically magnifies a galaxy by around 10 times. Uh, so you can see 10 times fainter than you would have otherwise. It preserves uh, surface brightness and color. So, you know, if a galaxy is red, it will appear red. And you can kind of, to visualize gravitational lensing, what lensing does, you can look in this bottom right corner, there's a candle. And if you take the base of a wine glass and you sort of tilt it at different angles in front of this candle, you can see that it creates these distortions. Can you see my mouse? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So you can see that it creates these distortions. And if you look at, you know, if it's perfectly aligned behind the, the base of this wine glass, you can see that it looks a lot brighter than just that candle because all of the light that is coming, that is, you know, emanating away from the object. So let's say like if your object is here and you have light that's going this way, because there's such a massive galaxy in front of it, the space there will bend this light and it will go towards us. This is us. And, but because of that, it means that the galaxy looks distorted because if you have light, you know, light emits radially from an object, right? Like if you have a light bulb, you have light going in all directions. Um, so if it goes, you know, if it passes under the really massive object, then you, it looks to us like the galaxy is here. And if it passed over the massive object, then it looks to us that the galaxy is here. Um, so it's distorted, but it's a lot brighter than it originally was. Um, so again, the other cool thing about gravitational lensing is the fact that this is one galaxy. Usually galaxies look like little point sources or disks, but here it's stretched out, which means that we can really study in depth each part of this galaxy. So we can study, you know, this region, is this region forming more stars or less stars? What does this region look like? So we can really, because it's so stretched out and distorted, we can really study like each slice of the galaxy. The problem, and you can kind of, you know, guess this, is that this isn't what the galaxy actually looks like, right? It's super stretched out and distorted. And a lot of people are working on figuring out, okay, if that galaxy wasn't magnified and distorted, what would it look like? And here's an example. It's not, it doesn't look very realistic. Um, maybe, but maybe, but it tells you sort of what the average size could have been and, you know, what, what general shape does that get, could that galaxy potentially have? So let's pretend this is correct. If you take this galaxy and put it behind this cluster, you get something that looks like that. Okay, questions? Does anybody in the chat room have any questions mm -hmm. before we go to the next section? Yeah, feel free to send your questions in and we'll take some between slides and answer them. Okay, but for now, I guess I can continue. Uh, okay, so my job is to take all of these clusters. So here's a less pretty picture of one of the six clusters that I showed above. And try to and try to catalog each each and every galaxy and object in this picture. So I want to understand, okay, for each galaxy, how far away is that galaxy? How many stars is it forming? How massive is it? How luminous is it? How is it contribute, contributing to the overall dynamics of the cluster itself? Um, I also want to understand what are the properties about the cluster if we can figure out how heavy a cluster is, we can also know how the light will bend around it um, and how much it will distort space. Okay, so what I do is I catalog every galaxy. So it looks something like that. Okay, maybe you could have, you know, sort of picked that out with your, with your eye and sort of, you know, put a, put a circle around each object. But why don't we zoom in to this region next to the cluster? 
get a lot of galaxies, a lot of sources, and you can kind of see this lensing effect over here. You see that it's sort of in a circle, kind of sphere, spherically symmetric around the center of the cluster. So there are a lot of objects. Well, why don't we zoom in even more into this region? Okay. And there are even more objects. So in this field alone, there are around 4,000 different galaxies. So Amanda, that actually ties in really well to a question that we got. Uh, what are some of the things that you would use to tell which smudges are actually the same galaxy that are, but are lensed? So which one of these, so typically, which one of these smudges are actually lensed and or are the same galaxy? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. What would yeah, you do to so, find that out? So like, how do, how do you tell that it's the same thing? Yeah. So galaxies have a fingerprint, so to speak, and that's contained in their spectra. So how much light does it emit at every wavelength? So in, you know, in the UV filter, in the optical filter, in the infrared filter, and if we understand how much light it emits at each wavelength, we can create a spectra. And it has a spectra. Um, and so there are a number of assumptions we can make that, so it is from the same galaxy. That means the galaxy should be the same color and the galaxy should be at the same distance away from us. So we use the spectra to figure out how far away the galaxy is. So once we get all of the information, the distance information about these galaxies, we can say, okay, well, these four, you know, smudges are arcs, they look distorted, and they're also around, you know, redshift three away. They're also around like a billion light years away. Um, and so, so we can say, okay, then those are probably from the same galaxy. The other, the, the complementary way to do that is to figure out, to create like a model for how the massive cluster in the center bends space. And so we should know how each galaxy behind this cluster will be distorted if we know how massive and what shape the foreground massive cluster is. So we'll know, okay, so, you know, we have a model. And so if the, gal if the galaxy cluster has this shape and is this massive, then, and there's a galaxy behind it that's being lensed, then its images should probably appear here, here, and here. And so we use those two metrics to figure out. Awesome. Yeah, that yeah. was great. It's also like geometric. Like there's certain there's certain geometrical properties of the thing doing the lensing that you can predict um, how many times an object will be lensed and where that lensing occurs. Yeah. So we do that with modeling. Yeah. So Something else that I mentioned that I'm interested in is modeling the cluster gal or understanding the, the behavior of the cluster galaxies and the intra-cluster light. So all of the gas in between the cluster members. So something that I do is model the galaxies. So this is another image of one of the clusters that I'm working on. And uh, you can see that it's really bright. It's colorized in a different way um, to make it look prettier. <laughs> Um, but what I do is I try to figure out, okay, which one of these are members of the cluster itself, of the main cluster that's doing the lensing, and I try to model it. So this is the original image, this is the model, and this is the subtracted model. So you can see that once you subtract all of these cluster galaxies, it kind of looks like a flat field, like it, it's just a regular kind of field of galaxies. And the purpose of doing this, apart from studying the cluster members themselves, is trying to understand the faintest objects, because that's the whole point of this, right? To get to probe as faint and as far as we can. Um, and also to be able to, you know, study the properties of the background galaxies in general. Because if you have all of this light, then maybe you wouldn't be able to, you know, really understand some the properties about a galaxy that's right in the center or really close to it. When you subtract it, you can kind of get, you know, a larger number of galaxies in the field, or you can detect a larger number of them. Um, so that's sort of the end of the presentation. I just wanted to end on this last slide that Adam has been alluding to kind of in his, in his first, uh, Adam and Katya have been alluding to in the first part of the presentation, that the thing that I love the most about astronomy is that 
we are really time travelers, right? So all of these galaxies, all of the things that we saw in the in the Stellarium show um, and sort of in these images is we're seeing what galaxies look like at different points in time, right? If it took a gal, if it took this galaxy like five billion years to reach us, that means that the light travels for five billion years. That means we're literally seeing the galaxy as it was five billion years ago. So we're able to see different slices of the universe by studying galaxies that are closer or farther away. And not just galaxies you saw in the planetarium show, it was globular clusters and nebulae and, and open clusters and stars. And so it's really, it's really incredible because we really get a snapshot of the universe at different sort of points in its life um, and in its evolution. And yeah, and so I hope that with this data, we can sort of inform uh, the next generation of these telescopes like JWST and WMAP to probe really, really old galaxies and really understand the universe as it was in its infancy. Um, and that's it. I have a Thank question you. for you. Yeah. What is WMAP? I'm actually not familiar with that one. Um, WMAP is the microwave background. Oh, okay. Well. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, so it's a. It's the precursor of Planck. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a satellite that went up in space to measure like the leftover radiation from the Big Bang, basically. Gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So Planck is yeah. like the new cosmic microwave background. That cosmic microwave background is what tells us that uh, the universe started with a bang, with the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. You basically have radiation that, due to it being such a long time, it got stretched out uh, all the way into the radio, which is why it's called the microwave. Or sorry, the microwave. Sorry, not the radio. Microwave, which is why it's called the microcosmic microwave background. All right. So at this point, um, if yeah. you have any of the questions that uh, you thought of while watching that incredible presentation, uh, please feel free to throw them in the chat. Oh, Amanda or Katya, if one of you guys want to share your screen with something to keep in the background, I'm fine with a big image of Katya in the background, but uh, <laughs> anyway, we can have something up as we're discussing these. Uh, Wait, did, did you say I should share my screen? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. If you want to leave it, leave it shared on the presentation and we can refer oh. back to the certain slides. Is it up? Yep. Yeah. Plus, everybody can keep enjoying yeah, that comic. In... Yeah, isn't it yes. fantastic? <laughs> I do love that. And if, you, if you're not yeah, familiar that's... with some of the different things that were wrong with Hubble, you can go back and check out one of our previous episodes. Uh, we do cover that a little bit. And plus, there's, a t there's tons of really cool videos about Hubble everywhere you look. Uh, so if we don't have any questions, we're gonna, I'm going to start out with uh, Amanda, how does dark matter factor in, since dark matter is kind of one of the big things people are studying right now? Great. So dark matter contributes to the whole mass of the cluster or of the mass around a galaxy, just the general mass of the universe. Um, and so by understanding how you, how, what the galaxies behind it look like when they're lensed, you know, I said previously that we figure out where the galaxy position should be, the lens galaxy positions, based on the mass of the cluster. Um, but typically, the, the mass of the cluster, as measured by the light cluster galaxies, like the luminous matter, doesn't account for the full, the full amount of mass needed to be able to lens galaxies in the way that it does. And so, this is sort of an indirect probe of the dark matter content around the cluster because we know that it needs more matter for the cluster for background galaxies to be lensed in the way that they are. Um, and so we can figure out, okay, we know that it needs this much matter for this much total matter for the galaxies to be lensed the way that they are. 
And we know how massive the actual cluster galaxies are, but those two don't align. And so you, you subtract the, cluster, the luminous matter that you know how massive it is uh, from the total matter you know is needed to lens the cluster, lens the background galaxies. And you can figure out, okay, so that means there must be this much dark matter in the cluster. So it's actually one of, one of the most, you know, direct, indirect probes of dark matter. Gotcha. Yeah, something else that you can, that you can do. I don't know if it's worth mentioning, but uh, I mentioned something called the intracluster light, which is this like fuzzy gas in between the galaxies. So this is usually stripped stars or really hot gas. Um, and we think that it can potentially trace the dark matter density field. So the distribution and the shape of the dark matter under it. We also know that these cluster galaxies form in the, you know, density peaks of dark matter. So where there's a large, you know, conglomeration of dark matter, that's usually where the galaxies are forming because there's a lot of gravity there that's bringing all of these stars together. Um, so there's a lot of ways we can test dark matter with lensing and with these clusters. Well, so Amanda, what is uh, one of your favorite things that you're doing right now in terms of your research? If, there, uh, if you even have a favorite. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of like struggling with a lot of things. So I'm trying to come up with like the positive side. Um, I guess like one of my favorite things is, is not knowing the answer. Um, you know, you don't know oh. the answer. You don't know the answer like you don't know exactly what you're gonna get when you're studying these and you really need the empirical data along mm -hmm. with like, you know, the theorists who do the theories and you combine those together and you, you know, you try to understand how you're trying to push the frontiers of physics and astrophysics. Um, right now, specifically, I'm working on this, like one of my favorite science questions is what I just mentioned. How does the intracluster light, mm -hmm. that is the light between the cluster members that's made up of gas and stars. How can we figure out how well that traces the underlying dark matter density field? I think that is one of the more interesting questions because we don't have a good idea of what the dark what dark matter looks like because we can't. Mm -hmm. see it. Yeah. yeah. So I have kind of a, a simple kind of almost definitional question. Uh, what's the difference? Uh, okay, so how do you differentiate between what is a cluster of galaxies versus what are just galaxies that are near each other? Like, is it a matter of distance? Um, yeah, so galaxies that are near each other are usually near each other because of gravity, right? So they come closer and closer together because there's a gravitational like potential that brings them closer and closer together. So there are different definitions of what a cluster is. Uh, some people say it's like the matter that's within 200, uh, like 200 units of distance uh, around the center of the cluster. So, but what a cluster really is is just you know you have if you have a cluster if you have a galaxy right outside the cluster and it comes and it passes that radius, it'll fall into the cluster and it adds on to the cluster. Um, I don't. I don't think galaxies that are just close together are, you can say, are, they, they're usually, they, if they're not a cluster yet, like if there's two galaxies close together, they might be a cluster as they keep accreting mass more galaxies. I don't know if that answers your question. It does, yeah. So basically just if they're gravitationally kind of bound to each other. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that makes total sense. All right, I just went off this tube. Is there any other question? What made you interested in studying strong lens and galaxy clusters in the beginning? Like, yeah. yeah, how did you end up doing this? Yeah. yeah. 
not a you know romantic answer my advisor was like, oh here here's a project i want you to work on please work on it um and and that was to catalog the galaxies but sort of the science that grew out of that mm -hmm. uh this you know icl versus uh intracluster light versus dark matter and like understanding the dark matter distribution that sort mm -hmm. of you know, it came out of okay i have all of these data products and i'm really interested in understanding the relationship between luminous and dark matter um and this hasn't you know been that really studied uh so i thought i think that it's just yeah it's really cool but it you know was born out of my advisor saying here's a project for you <laughs> That's not always the, that's not always the a bad way to kind of end up in something cool, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, and and it's cool because now like he gives me quite a lot of freedom in the direction that I want to take with the science. Yeah, now I'm actually doing things that I want to like. Mm -hmm. I'm very interested in. Ooh, so and now we have a question. That... There's a. Oh, go ahead, Katya. Oh, I was gonna say the same thing. <laughs> there's a question from Alex in the chat um how many galaxies have you cataloged um so <laughs> these fields are really small so they're like way smaller than that uh ultra deep field that i showed you which was like one thirteen millionth of a sky of the sky um and so per each cluster you get around four thousand galaxies and each cluster has its own like parallel like ancillary field which we use to study uh kind of what adam was asking about how galaxies will fall into the cluster and become bound to the cluster there's around four thousand there um and so that's eight thousand and then you multiply it by six so like forty thousand ish that's yeah. a lot of galaxies <laughs> i mean the big like wide field surveys like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and DES catalog millions of galaxies mm -hmm. and LSST will you know catalog DES in a week. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, but I'm really like they call it like a pencil view into the universe because you're you're going very, very deep, but not very like wide across the sky. Uh, so yeah. Mm -hmm. In the thousands, in the tens of thousands. Wow. That's awesome. The, the sheer number of galaxies is one of the things that initially got me interested in astronomy. I remember in my astronomy class, my freshman year, we were given the Hubble ultra deep field and we had to take a small section, count up every galaxy, and then use that to estimate the total number of galaxies. And that lab is kind of just something that's always stuck with me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when I think, you know, really hard about the number, like how many galaxies there are and how big the universe is, I just need to take a step back. I need to not think about it too hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not like, okay, back to work. Yeah. <laughs> My brain can't wrap around that. Yeah. Yeah, once you start working with numbers that are uh, almost too hard to uh, visualize, it all just starts to get really surreal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do we right. have any other questions? Anything people are curious about? While we wait for any other questions, uh, I just want to interject quickly that uh, if you liked what you saw, please go check out some of the other shows. Uh, share this one on Facebook. Once we wrap up this live stream, it will be a video on our YouTube channel, so you can come back and watch it, show it to whoever you want, uh, another thing, please go visit our website. We have a bunch of cool information on there. You can watch the video to find out more about who we are as Glass Education. And also there is a wonderful donate page by that was created by one of the uh, commenters in our chat box this evening. So a little shout out to Alex Traub. So please go and check out our website and we appreciate any and all donations. Uh, but otherwise we wanna thank you guys all for coming tonight. So unless we have some last second questions Katya, do you have any questions you want to ask Amanda? I, you know. Yeah, I think. All right. I think with that, we are I'm ready good. to wrap up. Uh, 
on behalf of everyone amanda i can't thank you enough for coming on uh, to share your knowledge it's been mm -hmm. a real pleasure to have you with us thank you so much for having me yeah glass is awesome so definitely check out mm -hmm. their last couple of episodes and their website as well uh, so thanks for having me too of course amanda's amazing thank you <laughs> and uh, yeah I'm, and oh, go, ahead. Oh. go ahead katya Oh, I was going to say, um, if you are still uh, up around 1130 and are not sleepy at all and something to do, uh, please join us at that time for some live telescope viewing. Yes, tonight at 1130, we're going to be using the Stone Edge Observatory, of which Amanda has a large hand in the operations of said mm -hmm. observatory. And we will be looking at multiple different galaxies and kind of comparing those images live. So you guys can join us for that, for some live astronomy. Also something that is in the chat box, in case you're not reading the chat box, next week at this time, we will have Diana Coleman, the president of the Yerkes Future Foundation, here to talk to Kati and I about all things Yerkes. And we'll be talking a lot about different things involving uh, discoveries from Yerkes that have to do with things that we can see in the night sky. But with that, we will eventually work on a signature send off at some point for our show uh, but as for that <laughs> have a great night and hopefully we'll see you guys again at 11 30 tonight yeah see you guys later <laughs>